Welcome to Nightchild Talks Prince, uncut and unscripted. And now a word from our sponsors. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There are no sponsors. Welcome to episode one of Nightchild Talks Prince, uncut. Now, got a lot of things to get through in this first episode, a bit of catching up, but I just wanted to basically quickly say why I'm doing this. I've been doing Nightchild Reviews, a Prince channel on YouTube for 10 years now, 10 years, and I've decided it's time to do something else. I want to do these unscripted 20, 25 minute episodes dealing with what's going on in the Prince world, it might be an album, an era, a concert, a video, an unreleased project, just something that's happened. And this is just an easy way for me to talk about my love of Prince. One quick personal confession. I've always loved the reaction and the kindness shown to me during my years running the Nightchild Reviews Prince channel on YouTube. I met lifelong friends. I've had some amazing moments, been to some amazing concerts. I've had comments with people who have such passion, knowledge and energy. It's incredible. It has literally changed my life and kept me going through some really tough times. And having my videos retweeted by Prince a number of times was an act of kindness I can never repay, just as I can never repay all that Prince has given me with his music over the past 35 years. I can't believe it's been 35 years since I became a Prince fan. <laughs> it's been a journey like no other. The only thing is, I will confess, I never really liked the technical side of making videos. You know, the editing, the software, the time spent on it, the frustration. Uh, because for me, that was all time I could be talking about Prince and trying just in my own little way to spread some of the joy he has given me through his creativity. So this podcast allows me to talk about a wider range of Prince topics and to do more and to produce much more content. It's back to basics, stripped down and simple in these rather crazy times. I truly hope you'll forgive me that indulgence. So the th first thing to say is really why Prince? Um, I bumped into somebody who is a friend, isn't a Prince fan, and I talked about the podcast and he said, why, why Prince? Why, why are you talking about Prince? Well, for me, it's simple. I believe he was the foremost genius of our times. Unbelievably next level music, embracing pop, funk, rock, classical, reggae, soul, rap. He had it all from the top of his soul shreddingly piercing falsetto to his deepest depth of his earthly baritone. He had a vocal range like no other. But this is just the tip of the typhoon, as Prince might say. He was a band leader a master musician, a peerless guitar player, a stunning bass player, a transcendent piano and keyboard player, a drummer, a drum programmer, a producer, an engineer, a mixer, and a truly unmatched songwriter who created the Minneapolis sound. Not only writing countless hits for himself, but for his own group, such as The Time, Vanity Six, Apollonia Six, Maserati, Jill Jones, to name just a tiny few and songs that just became hits for established artists such as Shaka Khan and Tom Jones, and also helped to catapult people to stardom, such as the hauntingly memorable Nothing Compares to You did for Sinead O'Connor. But, you know, even all that barely scratches the surface. He was a clothes designer, a dancer, a businessman, a philanthropist, and simply he was the most stunning live act I have ever witnessed. Prince's influence is huge and remarkable. He fearlessly took on the music industry in a way that, despite risking everything and sacrificing his fame, changed the music industry forever. Some of the top artists of the age now, such as Beyonce and Jeanne Monet and Alicia Keys, were assisted by Prince, and Beyonce called Prince her mentor. I must apologise if I get carried away when I'm talking about Prince, because... I'm autistic and I just can't help myself sometimes. He is just that good. Anyway, I hope you'll join me as we talk about everything Prince. These episodes are short, 
hopefully digestible and just a little bit of Prince to add to your day, whether commuting or at night time. Prince gave us so much and we are only now even just starting to catch up with all he created in one lifetime, with surprises still being discovered. And I just want to give a very little something back to this you know, through this podcast. It'll be a journey. Prince just wrote, uh, I remember he famously wrote once, you've just accessed the beautiful experience. This experience will cover courtship, sex, commitment, fetishes, loneliness, vindication, love and hate. Please enjoy your experience. And I would hope that we can add exploration, appreciation, discussion and wonder to that world of Prince discussion. So let's begin. What's been happening in the Prince world over the last few months? Well, we've had America's Got Talent, a group, a huge kind of choir gospel group called Sainted, basically performed Purple Rain on America's Got Talent. And this is interesting because, first of all, um, they played uh, and there's a big symbol of Prince behind. But it was really about the backstage machinations, if you like. Apparently, they wanted to perform Purple Rain, but there's a problem that Purple Rain is difficult to get cleared for America's Got Talent. And Simon Cowell was determined, apparently, to get the song, and he really wanted them to perform this song. But it did, apparently, if you believe all the stories, go right to the wire, and it was literally sort of, you know, a last-minute thing that he managed to get the Prince Estate to clear Purple Rain. Um, It was actually something that Harry Mandel explained and said that Simon Cowell was apparently up till midnight working to clear the song. So uh, if that's true, then it's certainly uh, an interesting negotiation. But the estate did clear the song and Simon Cowell gave it the golden buzzer, which means you go straight through and, you know, is a huge performance. Um, what was interesting as well was Simon Cowell's comments. He um, said that uh, he believed Prince was the greatest artist of all time and also that Purple Rain was his favourite song. So it's interesting to hear those comments uh, from him. And also, it's 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 the year of Purple Rain. Let's be honest, it's the year of Purple Rain. So to hear uh, Purple Rain again, kind of... And this is one of those great opportunities. Some people say, there are two schools of thought. Some people say, well, it's always the same songs, it's always the same things. But I think this is a way of drawing people in who either aren't particularly Prince fans or like Prince but don't know enough about him. And hopefully, some of those people will seek out his deeper catalogue and be drawn by this song and then seek out the album or another album and they'll kind of be drawn in. A rather similar thing happened at the Grammys where they had a really interesting version of Let's Go Crazy by Pentatonix, uh, Jay Ivey, Jordan Sparks, Sheila E and Larkin Poe and basically they all kind of did this kind of baton relay if you like of Let's Go Crazy where they all played a part of it in their own particular way and added their own style to it, their own interpretation of it. And again, obviously, Let's Go Crazy from Purple Rain. This is a way of getting lots of artists at the 2024 Grammys to really kind of like not only pay homage to Prince, but to draw people in and say, this is, you know, one of the great artists of our time and everybody puts their own spin on it. And there's so many different ways you can interpret that song. And Let's Go Crazy, I I believe, is one of the greatest as essential songs there is. I, I, you know, I've done a whole video about it on my YouTube channel. I think it's incredible, absolutely incredible. So to see that was fantastic. I, I'm always one of those people who want as much prints out there as possible. And sometimes in the mainstream, I know it's always it's always the same songs. But this is the year of Purple Rain. I think we have to forgive them this time. You know, it's it's let's go crazy. It's Purple Rain. That's what it's going to be this year. And obviously, with all the Purple Rain 40th celebrations. But I think, you know, fantastic to see all these artists because the one thing it does is it then makes Prince trend on on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, on, on, you know, Facebook. Um, It it allows an audience to hear his work or hear interpretations of his work that perhaps were into other musical artists. And that's how you find out how you discover Prince for some people. They will be watching the Grammys for, say, an artist they like, but then they'll hear this and they think, okay, that's interesting. I might want to know more. So I'm always for that. I think the more publicity you can do for Prince, the more people might come into this 
and they will grow his legacy. I think that's the same with React to videos when people you know go on YouTube and they listen to Prince songs for the first time and you see their reactions. Now, some people like that, some people don't, but I think it's getting younger people particularly interested in Prince. And I think, you know, that can only be a good thing. I personally very much believe you shouldn't be, you know, a gatekeeper. You shouldn't be somebody who says, well, we've all been in those groups where somebody says something about Prince. It's not quite 100 percent accurate and people jump on them or say, you don't know Prince. You don't understand. You're not a real fan. I don't like any of that. Let's bring everybody in. You know, everybody had to start somewhere. Everybody began knowing hardly anything about Prince and nobody knows it all. And just, you know, I learn something every week from people. And I just think, you know, let's just enjoy the music and embrace everybody as part of that. So those two performances, the America's Got Talent and the Grammys, were really quite interesting things uh, happening. The other thing I really caught my eye was uh, Purple Rain. Again, this is Purple Rain year, <laughs> is to become a Broadway musical. And this is incredible. Um, the Pulitzer Prize finalist Brandon Jacob, uh, Jacobs Jen Jenkins is apparently going to turn Purple Rain into a musical, um, which is really interesting. Um, I'll just read from a bit uh, from the press release uh, from Londell uh, Macmillan, uh, who's obviously, uh, you know, in charge to an extent of the uh, the Prince estate. He said, it's been almost 40 years since Prince's legendary film Purple Rain took the world by storm and we can't think of a more fitting tribute than to honour Prince and the Purple Rain legacy with this stage adaptation of the beloved story. We are thrilled with our Broadway partners and creative team who are bringing a theatricality to the film's original fictional story. We can't wait for a new generation to discover Purple Rain and for lovers of the original film and album to experience its power once again, this time live. Now, the thing is, films and musicals can have a huge impact on an artist's legacy. You only have to look at Bohemian Rhapsody and how that you know, really energised uh, new Queen fans. You only have to look at uh, the Tina Turner musical. You only have to look at these long-running stage shows where this can really draw in a new generation uh, for Prince. There have been some concerns, which I understand. There, the concern is that there are certain parts of the film, which obviously you know, was 1984 and mid-80s. It's a very different time to now. And if you wrote it now, you wouldn't write it in the same way. So there's concerns about how that's going to be changed, what aspects are going to be changed, how true it is going to be to the original story. Now, that would be interesting. That's a very difficult balance to make because do you stick to the original story, warts and all, uh, you know, um, and, and then there's elements of um, there's accusations that some parts are seen as misogynist now. Or do you say, well, this is a modern interpretation of Purple Rain and this is, you know, how we would tell the story now. So it's going to be really interesting. It's a very difficult balance uh, to get. Um, I would say that certainly in, in, in the movie, there are aspects where Morris Day's character, for example, is quite misogynist, but that's telling you something about his character, you know, the Morris Day character, not Morris Day, the person. It's, you know, Morris Day in Purple Rain is the baddie. Sorry for the spoiler alert. So I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, this potentially, you know, if it does well, uh, can keep going, you know, keep uh, bringing new people into print and, you know, that would be really interesting to see how well that's supported. I'd love to be in a, be a situation where, you know, I could go to London to see that or something like that. I think that would be really interesting. So I think at the moment there was some adverts for the role, uh, the roles sorry, within the musical for Prince and, uh, you know, Apollonia. And it's quite interesting to see who they're going to choose because you need someone really who can sing, dance and have the magnetism of Prince, which, let's be honest, isn't possible, but you can just try and do the best you can i guess um but the songs alone obviously you know purple rain when doves cry let's go crazy i would die for you the beautiful ones you know it's just going to be a really interesting thing and i think i like the idea of exploring prince through lots of different ways there's music yes but prince himself was into uh you know th uh, theater uh ballet with the joffrey ballet uh, theatrical productions ulysses things like that he kind of you know he really liked different kinds of media so i think that would be really really interesting uh, for me 
The other thing, and I'm always a fan of this, the vault, old friends for sale. That's the vault, the album, not the entire vault. The vault, old friends for sale, is coming out on vinyl. Uh, it, it actually came out the 23rd of February. I'm just, I'm just showing my uh, <laughs> my up to date analysis. And I was really glad to see that come out because, first of all, I think it's an overlooked album. At the time, it was considered one of these kind of, oh, it's a contract filler. And people sort of criticised it and said it was just way Prince of getting out of his Warner Brothers contract. But actually, some great songs on there. It's now out on 180 gram vinyl. Obviously, you've got the tracks, The Rest of My Life. It's about that walk. She spoke to me. Five women. And I will say about five women. I think Joe Cocker also does a fantastic cover of that song. It's a really great song. Then there's the when uh, when the lights go down, my little pill, there is lonely, old friends for sale, Sarah, and extraordinary. It was interesting because at um, the fantastic Montreux Jazz Festival, Prince kind of you know lent into kind of more of the jazzy aspects of his work. And this album, I think when you I particularly think of uh, when the lights go down. Uh, you know she spoke to me it just has that real kind of jazzy feel and it's a really interesting album I believe the first thing that needs to happen is everything Prince put out every official release and I'm including you know the protégés I'm including uh, The Time or Vanity Six or Apollonia Six or English Affairs or every album should be out there so people can actually access it that's the most important thing get the work out there that's the first thing you do as you stay get everything Prince did officially out there that's the ba- basic thing you, sh- you need to do and I think this is part of it and it creates a little bit of a buzz I think always take advantage of these things take advantage of record store day you know always put something out for Prince there's so much to put out so much he has never miss a chance and record store day should never go by without uh, you know something from Prince so I would say that's you know another positive thing the more we can kind of get all this work out there because there's still some albums out there that just you know are being neglected are are kind of not available to purchase in various formats or aren't on streaming or whatever and I think that's that's really really important um I think the other thing I was going to mention is that it's a really difficult time in terms of the Prince Estate and when hasn't it been a difficult time because it's been a difficult time for the Prince Estate for quite some time in terms of lawsuits I think you know they've spent nearly 40 million pounds um, 40 million pounds on uh, lawyers which is just you know I, I I can't even get my head around how you can spend that much on uh, you know on lawyers but there is now another uh, lawsuit um, now obviously I'm not going to go into the, the, the huge details that would take up a huge uh, you know uh, an episode all on its own quite frankly um, but it's basically, you know, an, an internal uh, a dispute. Um, there's parts of the family who are not happy uh, with the situation. Um, basically, um, we have these two competing camps, and we have the um, sort of the family side of it, and the company Primary Wave, and the family side had uh, Londell McMillan and Charles Spicer to manage them. However. Um, Macmillan and Spicer filed a lawsuit that alleged four of Prince's family members had been improperly trying to force them out of the company, trying to get rid of them. Um, so the new lawsuit from Macmillan and Spicer is against uh, Prince's half-sisters Sharon Nelson and Noreen Nelson, his niece Brianna Nelson and his nephew Alan Nelson. And uh, Macmillan and Spicer wrote, according to Billboard, The individual defendants lack any business and management experience, have no experience in the music and entertainment industries, and have no experience negotiating and managing high-level deals in the entertainment industry. Now, without going too deep into this, you could do a whole thing about this. There are only two things I think most people agree on. One, we've spent enough money on lawyers, £40 million just gone. I mean, it's insane. It's taken, I mean, you think how long we are, we're approaching, you know, eight years down the line and second of all you know we just need to get on with it we need to get on with it we need to get the work out because when you have these things it slows things down we were getting a a a kind of steady 
production. We were getting 1999, the Super Deluxe, which is arguably one of the best Super Deluxes we've had, I, I, I believe. We had the Sign of the Times Super Deluxe. You know, we've had Welcome to America. We, we're starting to get this kind of, you know, rolling out of product and we don't want that to stop. And we just want a clear voice. And this wrangling, you know, we don't want it to keep going on because it just distracts from the main thing, which is Prince's music. It wastes money and it distracts from the main thing, which is Prince's music. So I'll leave you on that note. Sorry, it's depressing. I would say, as a counter to that, my biggest piece of mental health advice ever. Put your headphones on, put prints on, go for a walk somewhere, whether in nature or just get outside or just close your eyes or whatever you want to do. Just put prints on, turn those headphones on and escape to another world. And Prince can do that. He can transport you. His positive impact on my mental health and I know mental health of other people is incredible. So that's all I'd recommend. Headphones, print, enjoy your day. And I'll see you very soon. Thank you. Welcome to Nightchild Talks Prints. Uncut and unscripted.